Nicola, I wanted to catch up with you, sir. We've got to do two things, a range of things, but the first two. Let's talk about tech, and then we'll talk about commercial real estate. For tech, you said to us recently that your broader return assumptions are lower going forward from here. Does the same apply to this particular cohort of stocks in the US? Well, we've had a, a huge rally last year, and a very large proportion of the returns we had in the fund were from the top top seven companies, right? Now, if you adjust uh, S&P for that, the, the return was something like 12% instead of 26. And you kind of have to ask how long that's going to go on for. Now, I'm, I'm a diehard believer in, in AI and the effect it's going to have on our operations and the world generally, but in terms of valuations of the companies, that's a different question. There is this issue of how fragile it makes the market to have such a consolidated group of stocks driving all returns. Karam Chowdhury of JP Morgan recently warned that there was a bigger risk to the overall equity market as a result of this, saying the key takeaway is that extremely concentrated markets present a clear and present risk to equity markets in 2024. Just a very limited number of stocks were responsible for the majority of gains. Drawdowns, on the other hand, could pull uh, equity markets down with them. Do you agree with this, or do you you think that ultimately AI is the only game in town and it doesn't matter how consolidated that the entire equity valuation uh, of the global market really is to it? Well, for the, uh, the first thing is that this has been going on for a long time, right? It's not something that's happened overnight. These large companies have become stronger and stronger. And it's natural when you talk to uh, to these platform companies that it really, it really is a winner-takes-it-all uh, economy. And it's amplified by AI because it's so incredibly expensive to train the models that you really have the winners becoming even bigger. So it's not the new phenomena, and I think it will last for some time. Winner-takes-all uh, really raises this question of the purpose of diversification. And Nikolai, I'm wondering especially if the diversification was responsible for the underperformance this year. Does that mean that maybe diversification doesn't have the same benefit and you should just consolidate your bets in what you believe in? Well, we are, um, given that we are a very large investor, we have to be diversified, right? So we, we own a bit of all the listed companies in the world. We are, participation, we are participating in 9,000 companies. Um, we have big bond holdings. We got big real estate holdings. I think it's the only way to, to be as a, as a big and, and very long-term thinking shareholder. I saw that real estate holdings dropped more than 12%. Let's talk about that a little bit, Nikolai. Something you said to me a long time ago has always stuck with me. When you're as big as you are, it's not what you're in, it's what you choose not to be in that really counts. Does that apply to real estate going forward from here? Well, we have um, some a bit more than 2% of the fund in uh, in unlisted real estate. And you're right, uh, clearly results were negative last year, but there'll be some years when it's when it's positive. So we think it could be an opportunity to uh, to look to to add to some assets. Uh, if you are a long-term investor, it's, it's part of your mix. Would you be actively now looking then to add to real estate, Nikolai, or still too early? Uh, it's it's difficult to say. We are we are always looking for for good uh, for good opportunities. The reason I ask this, as you know, is because you've already told us that you think maybe inflation is stickier, rates stay higher for longer. When you have that kind of worldview on the macro side of things, on central banks, how does that influence your thoughts on what you need to be in and what you want to steer away from? Well, I think that um, inflation could be tougher to get down than than what some people think. Uh, we are seeing wage demands across the world uh, being pretty strong. This is something that hits all the companies. And typically what we see after a round of wage increases is that the companies raise prices to, to offset that kind of cost pressure. So um, that's one of the risks we are looking at. We are looking at geopolitical risks. So uh, I don't know, it, it doesn't add up to a very happy cocktail. And I think in that world, you, you just really need to be diversified across asset classes. In uh, such a ge geopolitical moment, how much do you find yourself picking winners uh, in terms of regions it, it, with respect to artificial intelligence, but also with respect to just being able to beat inflation? In other words, is U.S. still the brightest place uh, to concentrate more investment? Well, we um, we have nearly half the half um, the value of the fund is invested in the U.S. and we think we own tremendous American companies. Now, I lived in New York the whole of November. I met with some 30 CEOs, and wow. Things are going pretty well there compared to Europe. So it uh, feels like a good place to be with, um, with a large part of the fund. So you'd be interested in increasing allocations to the U.S. versus Europe on the margins, understanding that you remain diversified? Well, we, we have been doing that over the last uh, year or so. But we feel pretty, pretty happy with the mix we have now. 
Going forward, uh, there's a real question around uh, just how much returns are going to be lower and how to beat them, given the fact that the goal really is to uh, just marginally increase uh, returns based on the index. Where do you see the outperformance coming from other than artificial intelligence? Well, we have to, you just have to pick the winners in all uh, industries and all categories. You know, you will have win you basically will have winners in the luxury goods industry. You'll have winners in the cosmetics industry. You just have to have portfolio managers who really understand these sectors really, really well and pick the winners in the pharma industry and so on. And we got some great portfolio managers, and that's what they're doing all day long. You said in January the way to make money in the long term, you have to be contrarian. Nikolai, what's the contrarian bet for you right now? <laughs> well, I have to say, when you, if you want to be contrarian, um, you know, you walk down the main street of Davos, uh, AI on all the different windows. The contrarian thing now would be to to underweight AI. Are you doing that? No, oh, we're not doing that in a in a big way. <laughs> but if you really want to be a contrarian, that's probably what you do, and you probably pile into a, to uh, to property stocks. When you talk about uh, some of the pharmaceutical winners, how much are you betting on the whole Ozempic existence of our future? Well, it's one of the biggest holdings we have. It's Novo Nordisk in Denmark. Uh, it now passed LVMH as the biggest company in Europe. We have big holdings there. They do a tremendous job. And it's uh, really, really exciting what this can do, not only to obesity, but also to all the other uh, various illnesses which are related to it. Nikolai, what are your thoughts on rebalancing when a name becomes the biggest holding or at least one of the biggest holdings that you have? Do you just stick with your winners? Is that your approach? We uh, try to stick with winners. It's, uh, you know, just in psychology, many people want to sell the winners. Uh, the way to make money is often just to ride the winners and continue to be in there. And we would typically do that anyway because we are a relatively index near uh, fund. So uh, so that's what we did.